Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and the Asia Pacific Business Strategies Program. My name is Michael North, and with this program, we try to highlight some of the leaders of Hawaii's society and industry and culture so that we can understand better Hawaii's role in the center of the Pacific, looking in one direction to the Americas and in the other direction to Asia. So today we have a very interesting guest from one of the leading companies in Hawaii, Hawaiian Electric Company, and its sister and connected companies are they're the only, provider, only providers of grid power in the Hawaiian Islands. So they perform a very uh, heavy responsibility and a stewardship for the citizens and for, uh, for businesses. And this company invests heavily in technology innovation and in infrastructure and in public education. And it's a full-time job to keep up with all of the fast-moving changes in the energy landscape in Hawaii. So explaining all of that is the job of Peter Rasek, along with his group at the Corporate Communications Shop. You're just right across the street from us here, Locker right? two away, yeah. that's right. So we're gonna look at the many different forms of renewable sure. energy that exist, assess which ones are being used in Hawaii mm -hmm. and what their status is. And we'll be looking at wind, ocean, biomass, hydro, sure. and so on, and the, the just, role that HECO plays. I don't want my friends on Kauai to be angry, so let me point out that Kauai Island Utility Co-op is an entirely separate company. Uh, we have friendly relations, but no actual business relations. So right. uh, we take care of about 95% of the population of the state, and they take care of the rest and do a good job. So, I'm sure they do. I don't want yeah. them to be, you know, they'll call me up in a flash and say, <laughs> okay. like, what, what, what? <laughs> so we're really interested in the long-term goal of energy independence, sure. which has been proclaimed really by business leaders and civic leaders, by the state legislature, by the governor, and so on, in a series of actions that it started really 10 years ago and are gradually getting scaled up, becoming more serious, more substantial, more definitive, and HECO, of course, will, pay, will play a lead role in our accomplishment of that energy independence goal. And talk to, us, talk to us a little bit about that. Right, well, uh, 10 years ago or so, the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative was signed formally, but actually Hawaiian Electric's involvement goes back a lot further. Uh, we were, uh, we put, had some experimental wind uh, turbines up on the North Shore. Uh, in the late 90s and early 10s. Uh, we've been looking at renewable energy uh, over the long haul for a long time. But about 10 years ago, as you say, people got serious about it. We signed an agreement with the state and the federal government, and eventually that was codified in law. Uh, our goal is 100% clean renewable energy for electricity uh, by 2045. Mm. And we think we can get there sooner. Uh, but uh, we are... Where, where are we going to be in 2030, the intermediate 30. point? Well, uh, we are, to, at the end of last year, we were at 27%. Yeah. And uh, by the end of this year, we'll be a couple of percentage points higher. And our next major milestone is 2020, when we need to be at 30%, and we'll uh, probably be there or higher. Are we uh, at 27% yeah. now? We're really at, at, in the lead among the 50 states. Right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, What's, no well, who's state. number two? Um, I, you know, California does uh, very well, and of course, on a much larger scale. Uh, and they've recently passed their own law, and they're looking to get to 100% by the 2040s as well. Mm. Uh, but they are uh, still uh, way behind us uh, as where we are today. As a percentage. Yeah, as a percentage. Who are the other leaders, like the well, top five? Uh, Nevada is also very strong in Arizona. They have a lot of solar at their disposal. Uh, some of the, the northwestern states where they can use hydroelectricity, yeah. uh, which counts as a renewable, although some people prefer not to count it because it doesn't. Uh, it's it's it, the oldest renewable. Well, that's, it's been that's around true. for a hundred right. years, right? And it has, and you know, the dams that that make it possible are not necessarily environmentally friendly. But uh, without getting into that, uh, Florida does very well. Um, and uh, some of the surprising states, you know, there's a lot more solar in Minnesota 
than you would expect. Yeah. Uh, but There's I, a lot I, more solar in Sweden than you would expect, well, too. Well, yeah, that's People true. People think, of, well, it's dark there. How can there be solar? Right. right. They do solar, and they do a lot of wind, and, of course, they have hydro as well. Yeah. So every place is different based on what the resources they have are. We have great resources, as we're going to discuss. Yeah. We have wind. We have sun. Uh, we don't have a lot of running water, but we have a little. Uh, so we're in a, an ideal position, and uh, the prices for a lot of these things are coming down very rapidly, where yeah. the price of oil has been stable for a few years, but is uh, kind of inching up now as well. So, uh, you know, we're in an ideal position, but uh, it's not just about the generation. It's also about preparing the grid uh, preparing our, our energy management systems yeah. uh, to accommodate all these various different kinds of the energy. The smart grid. Smart grid, yeah. exactly. Uh, in the old days when you had basically power plants that you could turn up or down, uh, it was not simple, but you, it was very predictable. Okay? Right. But uh, when you have wind, when you have solar that are variable, unpredictable, uh, bad weather, and all of a sudden your solar's not giving you the power it used to. Yeah. Today is a perfect example. It's raining. Yeah, <laughs> like, but there's you know, still solar there's energy. There's still coming. solar, but yeah. it doesn't reach the you know the capacity that you you right. hope. So but it's not zero. It's got it's not zero. Day. Definitely not during the day. It's not zero. And uh, energy storage is also a, a very big function that's now yeah. coming into um, its own. It's always been too expensive. It's still expensive, but. Uh, for example, we've just uh, we're in the process of signing contracts for seven new solar facilities on all three islands that all have storage. So that energy that is produced in the middle of the day will be available at five, six, yeah. seven at night, and that's huge because that's been the the stumbling block for solar is that you can only use it when the when the sun is shining yeah. or during the daylight hours, and uh, this will make a huge difference. So we have an overview video about okay. renewables from HECO that I think puts things in a nice visual frame. Great. Let's, can we have a look at that video, please? I'll learn something, I'm sure. <laughs> what does a green future for Hawaii look like? Our state has committed to achieve 100% renewable energy, and we've already made a lot of progress. A smarter and more efficient grid is being developed. It'll help us safely and reliably integrate even more clean energy from many renewable sources, including rooftop solar. And as an option to rooftop solar, you may buy an interest in the electricity produced by a renewable energy project, like a solar or wind farm. With more clean energy coming into the grid, driving an electric vehicle makes more sense than ever. It's a great way to save money and go green. EV owners can charge their vehicles when rates are at their lowest. And EV charging stations are being added throughout the islands. The Hawaiian Electric Company support a green future for Hawaii to reduce our dependence on imported oil and your total energy bill. Find out more about clean, affordable, renewable energy at hawaiianelectric.com slash our vision. So Peter, there's the overview. There now I want to start to, I want to break this down a little sure. bit, piece by piece, Absolutely. and talk about the role that each one of these has or doesn't have in the energy spectrum for Hawaii. Can we, can we look at the first graphic that shows the strategy? Okay, so biofuel, biomass, geothermal, hydro, ocean energy, solar, wind, you know, Hawaii is rather unique in that we play in virtually all of those areas. That's right. Right. There's not too many places that play in all seven of these areas. Right. The roles of different uh, significance. Can we look at the first one there? And let's do a little breakdown of biofuel. Talk to us a little bit about biofuel and where we're at in Hawaii with sure. biofuel. Well, we just in this last year opened the Schofield Barracks uh, generating station. A uh, 50 megawatt station in central Oahu that is uh, biofueled or can use bi uh, regular diesel, but it uses diesel, biodiesel primarily, and um, it's very important for resilience because it's away from the ocean, uh, and uh, that's going to protect it in storms. Uh, we have another plant, uh, the Campbell Industrial Park, and another small uh, installation at the airport that all use biofuels. Uh, these are fuels that are made from bio, from plants. Mm. And we uh, want a company here called Pacific Biodiesel, not are, are related to us, but we have contracts with them. They're actually producing biodiesel uh, on the Big Island. Mm. They're growing the plants, mostly sunflowers, I think, and they're They're pretty much all, all grown here, right? The biomass is here. 
Well, we wouldn't import it. No, we do um, import. We import yeah. some because we don't produce enough here locally. Oh, okay. So, uh, but th we're getting further and further down that road. I know there are digesters itself. and catalysts and so on that do the actual work, and some of that is probably imported as well. Right. We we import uh, biodiesel from the Midwest, where it comes from rendered uh, animal fats. Uh, uh, but we're gr getting more and more from a lo the local producer, and of course the goal would be to have it all from the local producer. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's always the battle uh, or the controversy: do we use our land for food or do we lose use our yeah. land for fuel? And we have to find a balance, and the market will find a balance. But um, so, so Hico will pay, play a role in delivering the electrons that come from biomass. Absolutely, there's a bunch of companies and other organizations that are involved in the research and the generation and so on, but right. ultimately when the electrons move out to the user, right. you're the common transport. So exactly. you have to work We deliver it all, whether it comes from yeah. one of our plants, owned plants, or whether it comes from an yeah. independent power producer, uh, that you know is another question. But So you're in investing delivery, in some biofuel generation now? Right? Yes, we, have, okay. we are. We have, as I say, these three plants right. uh, all together about um, about 160 megawatts of power plants that are biofueled. Okay, let's look at the next category. Sure. The next uh, biomass. Biomass. What's the difference? Well, biofuel is something, uh, some uh, biological product that is turned into a liquid fuel, in effect, biodiesel. Well, uh, biomass is direct burning of things that are uh, that are available here on Oahu. We have the H power which is biomass, it's, a, it's waste that it can be burned directly, and that's burned and turned into uh, electricity. So that's heat that powers a generator, exactly. a steam generator, and turns a turbine and it, we get electricity. Exactly, and yeah. the neighbor islands are looking at biomass as well. Uh, you can't just grow biomass, you can grow eucalyptus. On the big island there's a company called Huhonua, which is uh, nearing completion, and their plan is to uh, harvest eucalyptus trees, burn those trees, and create electricity that way. Right. So biomass can either be raw or it can be man-processed, which mm. is waste. The, the neighbor islands are also, we're all looking at, you know, vanishing landfill and the amount of space they take uh, there. And so we've, for some years here on Oahu, most of our trash has gone into the H power. Uh, they're looking at that on the neighbor islands. So unfortunately, trash is a renewable source. We're never going to run out of it. We're yeah. never going to, we can try to reduce it, but ultimately we have to uh, have to use it. And here we use so it for both electricity. Both of these involve fairly large scale infrastructure. Absolutely. And some pretty serious science behind them. Absolutely right. right. Let's look at the next one because that falls into the same category, sure. geothermal. We had geothermal was in the news a lot recently True. with the plant over at Puna that right. underwent some stress. How, yeah. how did we recover from that, by the way? That was a good test of yeah. some resilience there. Right. How do we do? Well, uh, not as well as we'd hope, but uh, what happened was that the lava did a little bit of damage at the Puna geothermal venture, but not too much. But the problem is uh, it completely surrounded the plant. Yeah. And uh, so without access... Had you ever modeled that? Uh, not, no, we, we had not. Uh, we, we have various contingencies about problems. It's an earthquake zone, you know, and, yeah. and it has the, uh, it's on a susceptible area. But uh, Puna Geothermal Venture, the owner, is being very responsible in our estimation. They're keeping their staff on salary. Uh, they're flying people by helicopter in periodically to upgrade, to maintain their facility, and they tell us they're coming back. When that will be, we don't know. Right. So uh, and that is a very advantageous kind of energy, however, because it's firm. It's yes. very much like right. a, a regular conventional power plant or a biodiesel power plant. They can turn it up and down and they can regulate it and they can tell us, or we can tell them, but we need a certain amount of energy and they can provide it. Yeah. So. Firm renewable energy is uh, highly desirable yeah. uh, as compared and to... And it's zero uh, cost. Uh, the well, fundamental yeah. energy is zero cost. It's the, there because we're here. Yeah, the, fuel, we're on the, the fuel doesn't cost yeah, anything. Right. Getting it into uh, a form, Usable form. Uh, is, yeah. is rather expensive. You have to drill wells. You have to have some fairly advanced equipment. Uh, and uh, But the actual the fuel, so to say, is, is free. Okay, let's look at the next slide briefly ocean energy, right. and as we go into the break, think about ocean energy. Okay. We'll come out of a brief break with Peter Rossegg from Hawaiian Electric Company. 
Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. We're back with Peter Rasegg from HECO, Hawaiian Electric Company. And we're talking about the subject that we left with was ocean. Right. Right. There's a couple of different forms of ocean energy. Right. Could you talk a little bit about um, wave, tidal, and thermal? I think that sure. those are... Um, the Hawaii does not have a lot of, of uh, ocean energy. We've had some very uh, constructive experiments here uh, with basically what you might consider to be an artificial blowhole, where uh, the waves come in and they force air through a, a blowhole that uh, then turns a turbine, and then as the waves retract, the, the air is pulled back in and it turns the turbine as well. The problem we have is that, um, first of all, it's expensive, like anything else you put in the water. Uh, it can be very expensive. And the, the other problem is that uh, our, we're the tips of volcanic, volcanic islands, as you know, so we don't have a lot of offshore, uh, low-level uh, land that goes out under the water for miles like they do in, mm. in Europe where they have offshore wind, for but example. But there is a way that you can exploit the difference in temperature between the you deep can, water right. and the surface you can. water. Uh, and w there is a company called Hawaii Seawater uh, Energy that, that is in the process and getting closer to using the cold deep sea water and the, the warmer water on the surface to create electricity, which would then be used for air conditioning throughout, say, the downtown yeah. area. It could even be used at the university. It's been a long time coming, but we're, we are optimistic that they will, will get going. So that basically is a way of taking a lot of generation off our hands. Uh, for air conditioning and uh, using this the, the seawater differential. Right. Um, it's done in a number of places, uh, especially in, in lakes. Uh, and we have some companies here that are specialists in underwater right. uh, piping and, and moving water companies. around. So yeah. um, we're, we're optimistic. Our, we signed up our building downtown and we are looking forward to the idea that a very large amount of air conditioning load a downtown, perhaps Waikiki, perhaps at the University of Hawaii, could be removed from our system. And if we don't yeah, have to generate one. the electricity, yeah. well, we get closer to 100% uh, renewables. That's a huge one. Okay, let's yeah. have a look at the next type of renewable. Um, so that, that's another uh, kind of version of something that can be done uh, in the ocean. I, I, I don't know what exactly that power plant I is. I think that might be OTEC. Or something uh, like could that. be okay. Yeah. Well, OTEC is is the ocean thermal energy conversion that we talked about. Uh, there are also we've also experimented with platforms, as I say, that look like a sort of an artificial blowhole. Uh, in some areas uh, in Europe, there are uh, they take advantage of the tide uh, mm. coming in and going out. Uh, as you know, Hawaii doesn't have a lot of tide differential between high tide and low tide, so there's mm. a limited amount you can do there. Mm. Uh, there are some companies that are looking into offshore wind, which would be um, wind turbines that are actually floated on platforms right, right. out in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, so that has not so far uh, gotten beyond much beyond the talking stage. but. It's one of those alluring things. These are that, all uh, R&D opportunities. Exactly. They're also business opportunities. Exactly. If someone really smart can be, you know, the Steve Jobs of exactly. one of these areas, then the potential is immense. Figure out how to do it for Especially a reasonable price. Especially if you're using Hawaii as a test tube. Exactly. Because across really the whole subtropical zone of the planet, yeah. you know, we have over 2 billion people who live within the, this, the Hawaii band. Right, And right. so we're... Yeah, if somebody can figure out how to do that at a reasonable price, we'd love to talk to yeah. them. Okay, let's look at the next one. 
The next one is solar, which is what most people think of sure. when they think of renewable energies, right. energy, but there are actually a couple of different kinds of solar. Right. Um, talk to us a little bit about solar and its status. The simplest uh, differentiation is there is privately owned rooftop solar. About 80,000 of our customers across the islands, uh, or over 20% of our customers in single family homes, almost a third in fact, have that kind of solar on their roof. They generate the power they need for themselves. Uh, if, they are, if they add batteries, they can use that power overnight. And then there is the grid scale or utility scale. Uh, we've got some solar farms out in uh, YNI. There's one being built by YPO and uh, by Westlock, and we've we've got several under under construction companies that are we're working with have them under construction in Central Oahu. As I mentioned earlier, we've got seven projects totaling 260 megawatts that we're mm. about to sign contracts for. And you're actually allowing customers to buy shares in a wind farm. In other words, rather than putting the panels up on their own roof. They pay you to put the panels out, and they receive a return on their investment in terms of electricity, right? Right. Uh, community solar allows people to participate, even if they don't own a roof, even if they live in a high-rise, as I do. Uh, it, we're just the, sort of the middleman on this. The companies will uh, build these, uh, these community solar and deal with the customers. Then the companies will tell us if so-and-so gets a certain amount of credit, take this money off their bill because yeah. they are participating in this community solar project. Yeah. And that's coming along. We have a dozen uh, projects that are now going through uh, our reviews and to make sure that we can accommodate them on the grid. And within what I hope is a few months, we'll be able to say, okay, these are ready for customers to participate. That's a really complex proliferation of a lot of different lot technologies of different. and economics and and, and grid distribution methods and so on. Right. All of this really has taken place within the last 15 years at the outside. Absolutely correct. Now, virtually none of what we're talking about right now existed except in concept 15 right. years Not ago. Not at scale. It existed in a laboratory perhaps or existed in a, we had these demonstration wind uh, turbines up on the North Shore in the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, and then of course the price of oil fell and the economics went out of it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, these things have been in the laboratory in many cases for many, many years. A wind turbine is not new. Uh, one of the earliest well, let's look forms at the last of, one here. Uh, of, the last type of energy, of right? Wind. There right. we go. But it was one of the first, right? One of the first. Yeah, up on uh, the North Shore. And uh, we had the, those experimental units up there. Now, uh, Hawaii Island is particularly strong. Maui Island, they both have uh, two or three big wind farms. There are two wind farms. Uh, here on Oahu and another one uh, that's coming close to getting under construction. Uh, wind is good because it's 24 hours. It yeah. uh, can go all night and sometimes it goes stronger at night than during the day. Uh, also, the Hawaiian Islands are blessed not just with wind, but with a very uniform kind of wind so that it's very much more dependable than in other areas. Right. Uh, we can't do very much, as I mentioned, with offshore wind because the, the, uh, the, the plates, the, the surface of the ocean goes down too quickly. Oh. Uh, but, you know, unlike Europe, so, you know, you go to Denmark or someplace, they have a, they have a, uh, a shelf under the sea that goes out for miles and miles. Oh. And they can cover those, uh, England as well. We don't have that, that luxury. So maybe someday we'll have these floating wind turbines. But for now, it's mostly on land. Uh, we're going to see some more on... Uh, What's the ones. balance relative between solar and wind in terms of total generation right now? Well, in terms of total generation, that's a tricky one because the wind goes 24 hours, solar basically just yeah. during the day. So although there's more solar capacity, the amount of energy being pumped into the system by the wind is probably equal, roughly equal to what we're getting from solar right now. Okay. Uh, but solar will continue to grow and wind, um, they're not too many places that you have the land and you have the public permission and the community willing to accept uh, a wind farm. So um, the, the wind is kind of, will be reaching its peak, we think, in the next few years, whereas I believe solar and storage will continue to grow uh, and will, will really be the main, the main source, along with the biofuels. What comes to mind is a tapestry here. Right. You know, previously we had a monoculture for energy. Exactly. which is hydrocarbons, right. burning ancient oil and, right. uh, and, and gas and so on. Now we have many different 
pieces of the puzzle. No one is enough exactly. to provide all of our generation. Right. So we really need to, the, the hidden element, the eighth element of all of these is the brain power to tie them all together, right? right? And the creativity. Yeah, and that's why we talk about a portfolio. We will never again allow ourselves to be uh, so dependent on one source of energy as we now are dependent on oil. Uh, same thing for transportation, of course. You know, electric vehicles are coming along. We're going to we're seeing some electric buses, uh, electric cranes at the waterfront that are uh, replacing diesel cranes. Uh, so uh, the train, of course, the rail when it comes will be electric electrically driven. So uh, both in transportation, which is more dependent on fossil fuels even than electricity, yeah. and of course in electricity, we're going to see the power coming from a range of portfolio. And you're absolutely right. The, the trick is always, you know, when you had just one kind of energy coming into the system, it was fairly straightforward to manage yeah. that and turn it into the electrons which are sent out to people's homes and businesses. When you've got various different kinds of energy, different amounts at different times of day, some that you can control, some that you can't control, some that you can see, some that you, you know, where our yeah. system operators can see it uh, coming into the system, so to speak. All of these things have to be balanced, and we have the computers to do that now, but we have to install the systems, the smart grid, the energy management systems yeah. uh, to make that all happen. And the, uh, the and final the, the element, if I The smart grid is really, oh, okay. Yeah. The, the final element is uh, what we call demand response, which is a kind of a funny name, but no. you know, customers can participate, uh, will be able to increasingly to our participate in uh, helping us to stabilize the grid by having equipment that either stores energy yeah. on the premises or uh, allows us to turn off some of their energy for a period of time, or, um, you know, all those electric vehicles potentially are a big battery. Yeah. They're just driving around. Yeah. And, uh, but most all of them will be plugged into the grid at night. Yeah. And uh, if just like you can take power out, we can take, you know, we'll eventually be able to take power back. Yeah. So if we had an emergency in the middle of the night, we take power back. By three or four in the morning, we, we've solved the problem. We put the power back and we're all part of a, this integrated system. Now what's the main obstacle? to our achieving that 2045 goal? Time and money. <laughs> you know, uh, we couldn't do it all right now, even well, if we Well, time can had... be collapsed by money, so <laughs> maybe it's money. Well, it, primarily it, it is money because, uh, you know, we have to have, cust have companies that will invest in wind farms and solar farms and all of these projects. We can't, Hawaiian Electric can't and won't do it ourselves. We have to invite, withdraw capital from other places. We have to draw yeah. technology from other places. Yeah. And um, there is, time can be collapsed, but it can't be collapsed infinitely. Right. Um, it'll take time, uh, year by year, to, uh, to upgrade the grid, to improve these systems, to bring all these things online. But that, that it's, will it's take some time. very urgent. Absolutely. Right? It's, it's highest priority for the ultimate survivability and resilience of our state. There, there couldn't be anything more important. Absolutely. I mean, we just yeah. lost an island, a small island, a tiny yeah. island, to the rising sea levels. And we all, uh, pretty much all of us here in Hawaii, live uh, less than a mile from, this, from the ocean front. Uh, our primary economic d driver is on the ocean. Uh, our power plants are on the ocean. So oh, we, we've Peter, got to... we're out of time. Oh, all right. You know, <laughs> there's so much more that we can go into, and maybe we'll do a follow-up to this. Sure. There's some other issues that I'd like to bring up. Anytime. And I want to thank you, Peter Baseg, for oh, being here with us on Think Tech Hawaii and for Asia-Pacific uh, business strategies. We'll see you next time. This is Michael North.